An increase in migrants crossing the U.S. border in Mexico has pushed a city in Texas to breaking point. The mayor of El Paso says that more than 2,000 people a day have been seeking asylum, which has overwhelmed services. Another border city has declared an emergency after 8,000 people arrived th just this week. Their lives packed on top of a moving freight train known as the Beast. Migrants seeking a new beginning over the Mexican border. So there's this train in Mexico and it appears <clears throat> anyone can just climb aboard for free. These mostly from Venezuela, men, women and children, families clambering aboard where they can outside the Mexican town of Arapuato. They're part of a new wave of thousands amid a surge in illegal migration to the U.S. Sleeping on top of cardboard boxes here, these people had been waiting days next to tracks for an opportunity. Your VA says, despite the risk we take, I would say we have no alternatives until we reach our destination. Mayala is here too with her partner and six children. She says, my goal is to be able to get to the United States and enter legally with my family, to have the opportunity to work, for my children to study, learn languages and new things. So she wants to enter legally, that's fine. But we need to be careful about what our laws are, who we're allowing to come into the country legally or otherwise. Take a look at this. Illegal immigrants uh, are exerting a narcotic effect on employers. That if they're available, employers will always prefer to have illegal immigrants over U.S. citizens. So that illegal immigrants become uh, preferred workers. It's because the, to, to the illegal immigrants, the job in the United States at these so-called low wages are higher wages than what's available for them in Mexico or countries that they typically come from. And so the, the, and the working standards in the United States are much improved over anything. You know, we may think of them exploitive. By Mexican standards, in many cases, these jobs are very, are very lucrative. And so that the employers would much prefer to have uh, workers who are grateful for the jobs than U.S. citizens who tend to know that if you pay the lowest possible wage and you work people as, the, as, as sort of throwaway objects or like easily to be replaced, that they, they know that you don't really respect them for what they do and, and they're likely to be more discontent with the jobs they have and the wages that they're working for. So employers would much rather have workers who are grateful for these opportunities, very grateful, because no matter how bad the wages are in the United States, they're several times better than whatever would be available in Mexico. And so employers would, again, if they could have them, they always want them. And that's the narcotic effect over, uh, over being have to compete for U.S. citizen workers for those type of entry jobs. If, if employers didn't have access to illegal immigrants, they would either have to pay higher wages or they could substitute capital to produce more productive machinery and equipment. So this means that the to employers, in some sense, it means that there's going to be either investing in machinery or you're going to have to go through the idea of trying to really compete in a, and hold workers in a competitive labor market where workers are free to quit if they can get a better job or to improve themselves, the things that all through the rest of the U.S. economy we're, we're quite familiar with. In fact, it's just those the low-wage labor markets where, some peop where people get the idea that somehow that you can't find anybody to do these jobs. If illegal immigrants were pouring into the uh, into the lawyers or professors or journalists or lawyer occupations, this, this issue would have been settled years ago. But because they, they flood into low-skilled types of jobs, somehow this myth develops that there's nobody else willing to do these jobs. There's nobody willing to do these jobs at the wages that illegal immigrants are willing to work or to do that. And that's where the problem comes. If you allow them in there, employers will, into the labor market, employers will prefer them always over U.S. citizens and wages will not go up, and ultimately it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy when employers say we can't find citizens to do this type of work, they can't find them at the wages they want to pay. 
here on the Center for American Progress, raising the minimum wage would be an investment in growing the middle class. So you think that minimum wage doesn't affect you because you have a degree and you work in the middle class. Let's see about that. So let's see where you fit into this picture here. Okay, now this is the relative growth of after tax and transfer income. Looking from going back to the 1970s into the 1980s and then look, wow, hey, 1980s. We have a gap in the rich and the poor. Where do you fall in? Are you the rich or are you the poor? Has your wages increased since 1980? Well, let's take a look. You see up here at the top 0.01%. Is that you way up there? About almost 700% growth in your income. What about the top 0.1%? Is that you? No, I don't think so. And uh, that's all, more than 500% growth. What about the top 1%? Maybe that's you, one in 100 people. It's almost 400%, about 350% growth. It's more likely that you're in the 99% of people. Look where you're at. You're way down there. Maybe you're, you hit about 200% growth doubled since 1980. That's not much when you look at inflation. And we'll look at that. The 50 to 90 percent there at that bottom red line, 180 percent, maybe 60 percent, something like that. About 50 percent half of people here. Hasn't grown much. And so the wages of people who aren't educated they work for minimum wage. It does affect your pay if you're educated and you're working because you're looking at their wage and if it's $5 an hour or $10 an hour and when you graduate, they offer you $21 an hour. You're like, wow, that's so much more than what I was working at McDonald's when I was a college student. Got an alert here. You graduating and you're looking at a pay offer of $21 an hour or something like that or $18.50 an hour and you're thinking, wow, man, that's a lot of money because when I was working at McDonald's, I didn't get very much money. I was getting, you know, $10 an hour. Well, you should have been getting a lot more than that for minimum wage, but it does affect how much you make. Okay, so... Let's take a look at what unemployment is, because if people are coming into the country and they're taking unskilled jobs away from American people, what's unemployment? And why do we have unemployment? Why do we allow people to come into the country if we have unemployment? These people need jobs. Americans need jobs. Sure, I feel sorry for someone fr coming from a third world country and they're having a hard time. And so they want to come to the United States where it's better and work here. That's understandable. But what about the American people who are born here? American citizens, they're unemployed. They're looking for work, skilled or unskilled, educated or uneducated. We're all working class and it all is one group where we affect each other. And so, well, what is unemployment? Let's take a look. Let's take a look here at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. See what kind of lies they can tell us. Let's see, we have some charts here. Chart number one, unemployment rate seasonably adjusted seasonally adjusted from 2022 to 2024. And it's hovering in here. It's gone up, went up above 4% there. And over here is the non-farm payroll employment over the month change, seasonally adjusted, same years. And this is in the thousands, and we get up here to almost 500,000 there.
But let's come over here to the rate of unemployment. And this is by the Ludwig Institute for Shared Economic Prosperity. So yeah, about 4.1% they say here. This is the rate of unemployment headline. True rate of unemployment, 23.9%, so right about 24%. And that's what I see when I'm out and about with my friends and looking at society and my life living, the reality, the truth, the facts. Pay attention to reality. Thanks. Large numbers continue to overwhelm officials as they pour into Texas border towns. El Paso is described as at breaking point. More than 8,000 turned up in the city of Eagle Pass this week. The U.S. Homeland Security Secretary visited the president of Honduras in Texas. We are seeing an increase in the number of migrants arriving at our southern border. This is a reflection of the fact that the number of displaced people not only in the entire Western Hemisphere, but globally, is at an historic high. Our immigration system is absolutely broken. The majority of these illegal immigrants are unaccompanied young men, about 70% of them. They're not women with children escaping oppression. And a lot of them are coming from Venezuela. Take a look at this. Uh, Venezuela, beautiful country. Why would anyone want to leave Venezuela? Is Venezuela a poor country or not? Let's take a look. It is the second poorest country in the Latin America and the Caribbean region. What is the poverty rate? Above 91%. Here's one. Why is Venezuela so rich? It has some of the world's largest proven oil deposits, as well as huge quantities of coal, iron ore, bauxite, and gold. It has been one of the world's leading exports of oil, but the country experienced poor economic management in the early decades of the 21st century. It's very rich. It's one of the richest nations on earth. It's just poorly managed. Stop coming to the United States. Stay there and fix your own country. Fix your problems. Young men, unaccompanied men, 70%, of the illegal immigrants or unaccompanied men coming into the country and they can't fight in their own country to fix it like we did. Take a look at this. The labor movement. The labor movement started around the Industrial Revolution, a time in the late 19th century when America exploded in size and wealth. Advances in technology created manufacturing jobs and people moved to cities to work in factories. But it wasn't the workers getting rich. It was their bosses who raked in big profits by paying low wages for long hours. Fed up with big business, industrial workers created unions to fight for better conditions. Unions are the backbone of the labor movement. But what exactly did they accomplish? Well, for one, you can thank the labor movement for your work-free weekend. In the late 1800s, the average American worked as much as 100 hours a week. Unions held strikes to demand shorter work weeks and an eight-hour workday to make time for family and relaxation. The most famous strike, the Haymarket Riots, happened in Chicago on May 1st, 1886, with thousands of people taking to the streets, and their voices only grew louder from there. The labor movement also protested child labor. Remember those black and white photos of children with dirty, sad faces wearing overalls and beanie caps? Those kids weren't playing outside, but they were working in factories. In 1881, unions demanded that businesses stop hiring kids under 14. And slowly but surely, measures against child labor caught on around the country. Eventually, all those protests got results. In 1938, Congress passed a law called the Fair Labor Standards Act, which set the 40-hour work week, regulated child labor, and set standards for minimum wage and overtime pay. 
In the 1930s Where do you think and 1940s, that came from? workers were also able to negotiate health benefit plans from their employers. Though union membership is on a decline today, it's undeniable that the labor movement forever changed the way Americans live, work. This week, the Biden administration announced temporary protected status to half a million Venezuelans already in the U.S. But these are record migration flows, marking a turning point after numbers had dropped. And despite the dangers faced, more are coming. Adele Robinson, Sky News. So I hope this motivates you and I hope it educates you to know that the minimum wage does determine your wage, even if you are educated. You're comparing that minimum wage to what you're being offered. So think about that. Finally, let me leave you with this. There is a relationship between uh, income uh, our immigration policies at the present time and the growing of, of, of uh, income inequality in the United States. In fact, the, the Council of Economic Advisors during the Clinton administration even had that as part of their economic report of the president back in, I believe it was 1994, that this is one of the reasons, not the only reason for growing income inequality, but it was simply, the, as the Council pointed out, it is dis the flow is disproportionately persons of low skilled and low education, which means you're flooding a certain segment of the labor market, which is already a disadvantage in terms of being low wages. Uh, and there's no incentive now for wages to actually increase because you've got an, a growing pool of people willing to do these jobs. Again, that's one of these situations where if these people were, if this was happening in upper income jobs, it wouldn't be tolerated for a moment. But because it's, they're basically flooding in disproportionately into the low-skilled labor market, people tend to rationalize this by saying that uh, they're doing jobs nobody else wants to do, or they're grateful that, that you know that we can that we need these people, or they wouldn't be jobs wouldn't be done if it weren't for the presence. None of which is true.